And um, it wasn't until I started working as a, as a professional doing web work and started, um, like my, my, at that time my passion was doing print design, designing um, book kind of work and magazine kind of work. And I always thought of it as designing systems. So I was thinking about parameters and I was thinking about time, but just, you know, in, on a different scale. And um, as I started working in the web, I started seeing the potential for doing things that are more dynamic and more time-based and, and more flexible. And then it was really through seeing the work of John Maeda um, that made this connection for me, sort of like what I knew. I think it's more of a, more of a process, a methodology. And so related to processing, um, there'd been a tradition over a decade of, of writing tools for making graphics and making animation and making interactivity within the group and build things. Because how you build things as a creative coder is really different from how you build things in, in the more classic computer science way, um, where you plan first and then build. So this idea that we've really promoted with processing, the idea of sketching with code, I think is the predominant thing that I learned there, which is really a design process that you think through doing and you, you learn and you develop through making. That's the Sure, it, it kind of begins with um, a mess, tangle of ideas just floating around. Um, and sometimes one element from, the, from that large um, field um, will become clear and it'll be written down or it'll be drawn. And then that's, just, that's oftentimes the starting point. And for me, it's, it's about clarifying and, and sort of trying to make these really vague ideas, like these desires that I have to build something, um, become more and more clear as, as I prototype and make them. And then they gradually become more refined and then become final pieces. Um, um, but I really try and take from a lot of different areas of culture. I really try and listen to music as much as I can, um, watch as many um, extraordinary films as I can, um, read as much as I can, and, and try and let things mix and float in this nebulous area until something kind of sticks or catches. So as you When I was first started writing with code, I was making things that were very architectural. And so every single element on the screen was put there because I wrote a line of code to do it. Um, and then there, there was a time where i had been fascinated with artificial life and artificial intelligence for many years and had been reading um, sort of semi-professionally in those areas. And I started writing code that's built on emergence where you have a few simple rules and then the form builds as a result of these, these rules sort of acting themselves out. So I got really interested in general systems theory and cybernetics and started to try and bring those ideas into the software that I was writing. Um, for example, on the flight here from Los Angeles to, to Minneapolis, um, you look out and you see the riverbeds flowing. And sort of like, how did that line get formed? This meandering line that sort of switches back and moves around. And the answer is that it emerges over time. Um, for me, the important thing of emergence is that things are a result of a process um, where you have many elements. And in a case of like in, in the world, um, infinite number of variables sort of um, working together to, to cause something to happen. I think the most simple like, visual example is um, birds flocking or, or fish uh, schooling, where each, each fish is its own autonomous sort of um, animal, and they, and they, they have a few basic um, sort of guidelines that they follow, where they, they try and stay away from others, they try and move in the same direction, and as a result of that, these, these basic um, behaviors of these creatures, you see these extraordinary um, sort of secondary forms, the, the flock from the individuals begin to emerge. And in, in your work? I'm, I think science is extraordinary and fascinating, um, but it's also interesting to invent your own science that relates in no way to the actual sort of physics of the world. Um, and a lot of the work is based on that. So um, I try not to be a futurist. Um, I try and kind of, uh, but I, I try and be, well, I don't know. I, I do try and do that from time to time. Um, um, I'm really frustrated with the state of technology right now. I mean, I'm, at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how fast it's changing and, and what it was, for example, um, how it's changed over the last decade and the last two decades, even three decades. And I, I invest a lot of time in researching the history of technology because, you know, I'm, I'm from the point of view that if you understand the past, it gives you a better insight into understanding the future um, or the next level of that. I mean, I know a lot of people are investing a lot of energy and time into synthetic biology. And um, I follow that to an extent. Um, there's extraordinary ethical implications with that. Um, and that is, of course, a, a way of programming. Um, so definitely, that, that's a lot, of, a lot of energy is moving in that way. Um, that field is, is, uh, is nascent, but it's building quickly. Um, the, um, referring to um, 
computational technology and saying that you, you folks who kind of work in computational technology and think about it are always using metaphors of biology. You're talking about networks, you're talking about ecosystems. But he was saying in computational biology, we're actually using computational metaphors. And so I, th I thought that was really, really fascinating. And, and I don't really know what that means, but I think it needs to be sort of further, further looked into. Hmm. Oh. Um, we started it right as I was leaving MIT and I was starting to embark on my career as a professor. And I, I wasn't satisfied with the different options I had for teaching at that time. Because um, I really wanted the, the students to be able to focus on writing the software and thinking about computation as its own medium rather than um, wedging it into existing metaphors. So I think at that time, Director and Flash were the primary tools being, being used. And the idea of thinking about a timeline and thinking about code in terms of a timeline and code can be in different places within the program, I think wasn't a good first environment for coming to terms with like compu the potential of computation as a medium. And so we wrote processing where you can focus on it in that way. Um, and so the, I guess the cliche is like a, a low floor and a high ceiling. And that's been something we've always been trying to put into the tool. Like within an hour or two, um, people begin to make things that they're interested in making. But then at the same time, you can keep scaling. And professional programmers can use it as well and appreciate it from a different point of view that it makes um, writing code a little bit faster. Um, it, in this case, writing um, interact code for doing interactivity and code for doing images. Um, and it really images. Um, and it really all built out of a project that our advisor at MIT, John Maeda, was doing called Design by Numbers. And that was an extraordinary project for teaching designers how to think about um, code and software. But it had a, a lot of constraints. It could only be 100 by 100 pixels. It could only be grayscale. Um, but they, could, they had this property that you could walk into a room of designers who had never looked at a, a line of code before, and they could start writing their own code because it focuses on making images in a way that made a lot of sense within their visual language. Hmm. And was it? Yeah, we, Ben and I both feel that um, sort of infrastructure should be free and open. Um, people should be, have, have the right to, to modify it and extend it. Um, and so always from the very beginning, it, it, it was going to be an open source project. I think um, more, I think, um, more practically, though, as well, um, if we were to write processing from scratch, it would take a small team of programmers um, a, a certain amount of time um, to be able to sort of build it up from, from the very beginning. But by using open source tools, it's basically a set of modular pieces that we could put together and then build on top of. It allowed us for um, two people to really build a complete software development environment from scratch in just a few months' time. And of course, that was the first version of processing, and it's been extending a lot from there. But really, I think what's been extraordinary about the project is, is the, the libraries and things that have been contributed as open source additions or add-ons to the project. And that's what's really, I think, grown and, and built and extended in ways where it can be useful across multiple fields. And what surprised you? It was really just seeing people do extraordinary work with it um, and, and really pushing the software to do things that were sort of beyond our expectations of what it could do. Um, and when, the, when processing first started, there was a really active community on, on the discussion boards. And people were really contributing back and forth and really supporting each other. And people were really chipping in and explaining things. And so that, that, that um, sort of vibrant community encouraged us to keep going. But then, it was also, but then it was also, you know, people would pop up, like early, um, you know, like Robert Hodgen and, and Karsten Schmidt were just making these extraordinary things with it. And, and um, that really kept us motivated to, to keep working on it. Mm. And the code itself. I think that's just a part of visual culture. I mean, if we, if we look at the history of art, we see things um, emerge from one person and then, and then diffuse through many people. Um, I think the people who are really interested in people who build their own innovation. And um, a lot of people have been doing that. So it, for me, it's, it's all just a part of, um, part of our culture to see things mix and spread like that. Mm. Um, in doing that, the, this piece of code flips a coin, heads or tails. And if it's, if it's you know, less than 0.5, it draws a, a left line. If it's greater than 0.5, it draws a right line. And the code is all built on making this maze form from that simple coin flipping operation. And so as we were, we were writing a chapter of the book specifically about um, random and chance in the history of art and in computation, I started looking at it in more depth. And um, even just within the last month to prepare for the, for the talk, I've been looking at my own work through that lens. And um, I think I've been using it in a few different ways over, over the years. But for me, it, it goes along with emergence, or that you need to have a little bit of noise in the system in order to give it uh, an organic uh, quality. 
it's just sort of, it's essential to that. Because if you're simulating anything, and in my case, I'm not really simulating something specific, I'm more sort of simulating a, something artificial or, or simulating um, something I've imagined. Um, any given number of parameters isn't, isn't enough to sort of um, fully um, exhaust the boundaries. And so by adding a little bit of noise into it, you're able to sort of coax other forms to, to emerge from it. And Kevin shows here, can you talk about that? Well, I mean, the difference between what we call a, um, a, a pure random number, my understanding, is that you have an equal probability of getting any of the results. So if you have a die that's perfectly true, there's an even possibility to get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Um, and in a pseudo-random number environment, or dealing with um, previous tables of random numbers that, that aren't, as, aren't really derived um, as well, you, you would see um, you'd have more of a probability to get certain values. And so, um, where, were, where were we going with that? Oh yeah, different flavors of random. So. Oh yeah, so, so um, I think you know Ken Perlin invented what's called Perlin noise. And Perlin noise is a way of, in a way, smoothing between different unexpected values in order to um, create a more um, natural and fluid motion. And um, that's been highly sort of utilized within Hollywood for doing textures, but then also for doing, for doing motion on characters too. So basically you put a little Perlin noise in the joint and then it feels like someone's standing or swaying naturally. Or with Perlin noise you can develop you know, different kinds of like marble or wood grain textures and things like that. Mm -hmm. So Perlin decided, I, I spent about a decade exploring, like doing many different media, doing installations, doing printed work, um, doing a little bit of fabricated work as well, and collaborating with architects, collaborating with fashion designers. And what I've learned from that is that software is what I love the most. And so, I, but I mean, but within a large part of my life is teaching at UCLA and working with the students there. Um, and this, the, the idea that you can, the students are so excellent at working with software and really clumsy with their hands, um, but, but being able to make physical objects and understand physical space through their digital tools is, is a really extraordinary moment in education, I think, at this time. Sorry. I don't know what I do in the end. I mean, the, my process is always to experiment. It's always to try out a few different things and, and see what I think is most engaging and to kind of follow a tree. So whenever I make anything, it's always about branching off and branching off and branching off and then and gradually um, selecting from that. Like, I try and um, make things instead of cutting off ideas before I see them made physical. And so uh, I react to things physically um, with sight and sound and body and make decisions from that rather than um, trying to sort of not follow an idea because I think it might not work out. Mm. So I can't imagine right now. Ideally, anything that I do goes beyond what I can think of when I start doing it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, so one of my favorite films is Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. And it's not, I think it's full of so many flaws. Um, but I've loved his films always, I mean, ever since the first one. Um, and it's always maybe a 15 minute piece of the film that's my favorite. And so, but, the, the, but this last film is, is sort of that whole mood the entire time. And I think this idea of, um, I'm not really interested in telling a narrative, but I'm really interested in conveying mood or tone or emotion and, and having sort of just enough narrative thread to kind of keep you engaged. And um, I think that's wide open for exploration. I think that, um, it, it's not, it doesn't fit within the Hollywood system, it doesn't fit within the popcorn and ticket system, um, but it, it, it's, I think, I mean, and my, oftentimes my favorite film work is, is more of like the experimental abstract film and structuralist film. It's, it's dealing with real images, but, but dealing with it in more of a, a process-based way. Um, I think it's really open to merge with software and become something new. Um, um, cinema is actually one of, my, one of my great passions, and it's never, it's, it's It'll probably be built like a game, but not a game experience at all. And it needs to be um, have a high degree of interactivity, but also it needs to be sort of primarily visual as well. Um, and there's, I think there's a lot of filmmakers who've really like broken the mold of film over time. And um, I can't really yet imagine what this this new model of it's not cinema, it's not uh, a game, and it's also um, not an abstract visual, but it, it's somehow puts them together into something that's totally engrossing. Because um, I've, uh, I've played a lot of video games in my life, enough to know that playing a video game is, is a radically different emotional 
experience than, than watching a film or reading a book. And I, I love them all. Um, and I'm interested in some other experience. And what is it hard? Um, oftentimes when I start talking about it, I find people giving me blank looks because I start talking about things too abstractly. Um, and it's usually best to show examples and then people kind of, kind of get it. Um, I mean, I, I've been talking about for many years, as people have before me, you know, even since the mid or early 1960s, that there's potential in this new media for new modes of expression. And I still believe that. Um, um, sort of things that are happening on the sidelines that aren't yet sort of brought to, to main areas of culture yet. Um, I'm really excited right now about what's happening in what's oftentimes called the indie game movement. So like people who maybe, well, they're doing things that are experimental. They're doing things that sort of come from an area that previously you might have called art. Um, and they're, they're not really games, but that's the best sort of area or community and fit for them. And I think things are sort of, um, they're emerging in a way where it's not really possible to um, put fingers on them yet. Mm. Yeah. It's been a matter of time. And so I started off working, working small, working on screens. And then um, for me, the first experiment in shifting, shifting media was shifting into print. And I started doing small prints, 11 by 14 inches. And now I'm doing things that are um, you know, like 96 feet wide by 15 feet high in print. Um, and I think it just takes a while. It's, for me, it's been a, a process of getting larger and larger. And um, um, this idea of micro and macro scales, like when things are larger, you see something from a different distances and, and accounting for that in, in the work that you're doing. Um, and I think resolution is also works in that as well. So if something is um, maybe 48 feet wide by 11 feet high, but it's only 320 pixels by 1280 pixels, that's something else to experience too. And, and like with the other, you, you build it at scale, like um, you, need to, you need to see it and then make evaluations. And so you do the best you can and, and imagine what it would be like on a smaller scale. And, and then you, you blow it up, you do tests, you do samples, and then you adjust from there. Um, of um, moving it from something that's it's a close focus with your eyes to something that your full body engages with um, has ta takes time in order to, to understand and to, to think about space as something really, physical space as something really different from thinking about a two-dimensional plane. And so it's, it's evolved. Um, there's, there was previously an undiscovered history of, of artists working with digital media. Um, and it was actually coming from two areas. There were artists who were more entrenched in the art world who were using ideas of software in their work. And then also they were the early pioneers in actually writing their own code and writing their own software. And um, th this history of people writing their own code was, was lost for a few decades. And within the last five years, it's, it started to sort of resurface and emerge. And so learning from that work, I think you learn from what other people have done as a way of, of moving forward, because I think of, of Art is, it's not an evolution over time, but definitely um, uh, one aspect of it is, is innovation and sort of exploring new visual spaces and new visual ideas. And so you really need to be aware of, of what happened prior in order to, in order to have that context. And, read, and, more, and, read, and more importantly, not to just look at the work and experience it, but to understand the ideas behind it. Like for example, if you look at a Malevich painting um, now, you don't necessarily understand that he was trying to make something very spiritual and very emotional because we read, we read it in a really different situation. Yeah. So I was thinking about parameters and I was thinking about time, but just you know, in, on a different scale. And um, as I started working in the web, I started seeing the potential for doing things that are more dynamic and more time-based and, and more flexible. And then it was really a connection for me, sort of like what I knew and what I, what I wanted to know suddenly became really clear. And so I started learning to program when I was about 26 or 27. And, and then I, I really learned when I, when I got to the Aesthetics and Computation group and started learning from Golan and Ben and other people there. And can you speak? Interesting. Uh, you discover things along the way that, that you didn't imagine. And in a way, the, the computer and writing code becomes a collaborator and less like a, a servant. Mm -hmm. Something to happen. I think the most simple visual example is um, birds flocking or, or fish uh, schooling where each, each fish is its own autonomous sort of um, animal, and, they, and they, they have a few basic um, sort of guidelines they follow where they, they try and stay away from others, they try and move in the same direction. And as a result of that, these, these basic um, 
behaviors of these creatures, you see these extraordinary um, sort of secondary forms, the, the flock from the individuals begin to emerge. And in, in your work, so um, I'm fascinated and inspired by nature, but I've never tried to or attempted to recreate it. For me, it's always been about um, developing my own micro world from the ground up. Um, it's basically an abstraction of how nature works, um, rather than trying to uh, be an artificial nature. Mm. Lately, as a, a lot of people have been talking to me about um, massive parallel computing and really encouraging me to um, use these kinds of machines and develop a new way of thinking about the processes that I'm building. And um, I haven't really come to terms with that yet. So I think that's something, something to do. Um, or that you need to have a little bit of noise in the system in order to give it a, an organic uh, quality. It's just sort of, it's essential to that. Because if you're simulating anything, and in my case, I'm not really simulating something specific. I'm more sort of simulating a, something artificial or simulating um, something I've imagined. Um, any given number of parameters isn't, isn't enough to sort of um, fully um, exhaust the boundaries. And so by adding a little bit of noise into it, you're able to sort of coax other forms to, to emerge from it. And Kevin shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. So Perlin, when he was really young, was one of the programmers on Tron. And we all know what the aesthetics of the first Tron was. Um, I actually really prefer it because um, it's just really stark and it's all, it's mostly wireframe. Um, but I think he was frustrated with how unnatural and, and how stark everything was. And so Perlin noise for him was kind of a way of bringing more of a natural feel to computer graphics. So Perlin noise is really distinct from pure random numbers, which the idea of a random number is that um, the number that comes now has nothing to do with the numbers that came before and Perlin noise. And um, I can't really yet imagine what this, this new model of it's not cinema, it's not uh, a game, and it's also um, not an abstract visual. But it, it somehow puts them together into something that's totally engrossing. Because um, I've 